We were making history, and it wasn't nice and clean. It wasn't easy. It was complex. From Chicago, Illinois, the mighty Shallot. That led to the Panthers was what we were seeing on television every day, attack dogs, fire hoses, bombings. We stand on the eve of a black revolution, brothers. Now we have the emergence of voices within the community that were saying we're not going to continue to turn the other cheek. Please welcome filmmaker Stanley Nelson and the Atlantic's James Bennett. Hello, everybody. Um, that's the first of four clips we're going to show you um, from Stanley Nelson's um, latest great documentary, this one about the Panthers. Um, and I'm going to ask you to please set up each one as we go. But first, um, maybe give us the historical context a little more broadly. The Panthers came into being in October 1966, I think it was. And the civil rights movement already had substantial traction by then. The Civil Rights Act had been passed. Voting rights, Selma had happened. Voting Rights Act has been passed. So where did the Panthers come from? Well, there was a sense, you know, that um, the civil rights movement wasn't reaching the North. That, you know, the civil rights movement was basically a Southern movement and wasn't addressing some of the problems in the North. Also, the civil rights movement, you know, was pretty much kind of a church-based Christian movement in a lot of ways. You had the black Muslims who were more radical, but that was also a, a religious-based movement. And the Panthers were different. They weren't that. Would they, they t talk a little bit about the sort of fundamental precepts. Maybe the best way would it be to talk about the original leadership, mm -hmm. um, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. What, what did they believe? Well, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale were students in Oakland, California. And they kind of found out through a quirk of the law in, in California that you could carry a loaded weapon as long as you carried it out in the open. And the Oakland police were notoriously brutal. And so they came upon this idea of kind of policing the police. And they would ride around behind the police, and when the police jumped out, they would jump out behind the police with their loaded guns in, in evidence and uh, try to make sure that there was no, as they said, no brutality occurred. And I, I, I think you've rescued so much f from history, from the dustbin, really, with, with this documentary. One thing is people forget the Panthers were really the first real stalwart defenders of the modern interpretation of the Second Amendment, right? Long before the NRA seized on this idea. Yeah, one, one of the funny quirks in the film is that the Panthers are advocating, uh, you know, the, the right to bear arms while in a clip Ronald Reagan is, is, is advocating, uh, you know, peace and, and, don't, and don't bear arms. It's kind of a very funny little clip. And that's a good segue. Talk a little more about what we're going to see then in the next clip, please. Okay. So, you know, the Panthers kind of catch on. They're a local, basically a local organization in Oakland uh, who, who are following the police. And uh, they, California decides, okay, we have to pass a law that makes it illegal to carry a gun in the open. So the Panthers decide that they, w they had to protest that, and the best way to protest that was to go to the state legislature, of course, with their guns. So can we see the, the clip, please? The state assembly was in the midst of a heated debate when the young Negroes, armed with loaded rifles, shotguns, and pistols, marched into the Capitol. When we got in the halls, you have to imagine there's a hundred cameras, still cameras, print media people backing up, and I'm saying, where is the spectator section? And the press ends this way, Bobby. Some party members got ahead of me with shotguns, pistol, and wound up on the actual floor of the California State Legislature. They're heavily armed, whether their weapons are loaded or not, nobody seems to know. The armed group, who said they were members of the Black Panther Party, retreated to a service station several blocks from the Capitol. I remember this one cop came by on a motorcycle, and he seen all these guns, and he got on the, on the thing. 
And that's when they started to swoop down on us from everywhere. You have no right to take my gun away from you me. You don't know the Constitution, okay. right? Sure we do. We're well aware of the Constitution. I would like to have a gun, man. Why do you believe the legislature is, is racist? Because you know, you're a part of it, and you're obviously it's a white system. The news got to everyone in the black community who had a television, everyone who had a radio. It was in every newspaper across the nation. It put us on center stage. I don't think that loaded guns is the way to solve a problem that should be solved between people of goodwill. And anyone who would approve of this kind of demonstration must be out of their mind. When I heard about Sacramento, I was like, damn, these brothers are bad. They're here up in Sacramento in the capital, packing. <laughs> what you don't see in that particular clip is when they actually arrived at the capital on the lawn, then Governor Ronald Reagan was holding a press conference with school children. And you have the footage of <laughs> yeah, what happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so he's holding the press conference, and of course, you know, all the news people see the Panthers walk by with these guns and these rifles, and they immediately turn from Ronald Reagan and start following the Panthers. And this is really what puts the Panthers on the map, yeah. on the national map. You know, nobody had heard of the Black Panthers before. They were a local uh, organization, and now all of a sudden they've kind of seized the national stage. And how big did they get? There were maybe, you know, 5,000 Panthers at any, you know, at the most. I mean, you know, there was never a way to kind of count how many Panthers there were because there ended up being uh, uh, four, over 40 chapters of the Black Panthers all over the country. In cities all over, all over mostly yeah. in the north. Yeah, so mostly in the north. In the yeah. north. Mm -hmm. uh, to set up the next clip, if you would, talk a little bit about they were, they were very conscious of their style. They were very conscious of the message that they were trying to send at all times. Their, their PR strategy was pretty carefully thought through. Yeah, I mean, one of the, the amazing things about the Panthers is that they were so good at kind of seizing the media and manipulating the media. And part of that was the whole Panther look. You know, so, you know, we may not know anything about the Panthers, but almost anybody today could tell you, you know, the black leather jackets, the berets, the big afros, the sunglasses. And the whole thing was really calculated. It was in, in some ways calculated as kind of the anti-Martin Luther King, you know, the anti-Southern movement, which were suits and ties and very well-dressed and very proper. The Panthers wanted to make a splash and they wanted to get a media attention. And their whole look and the way they were um, and their aggressiveness was part of it. Let's please show that next clip. This brother here, myself, all of us were born with our hair like this, and we just wear it like this. Reason for it, you might say, is like a new awareness among black people that their own natural appearance, its physical appearance, is beautiful. Black people are aware now. They're proud of it. It's pleasing to them. Dig it? Isn't it beautiful? All right. <laughs> you talk about people who are teenagers. 17, 18, 19, 20. That's the bulk of the Panthers, are teenagers. So the fact that we were so young and the fact that this hadn't happened before, I'm not certain that we recognize how startling it looked to other people. There's a great moment later in the film where they're, they're doing their fundraisers in New York City right. and they talk about how they would um, they choreograph those sessions for maximum impact. Yeah, that, that, that's a funny moment. It, they're actually talking about a, a party at Jane Fonda's house yeah. to raise money. Um, and they, the Panther that we interviewed says, you know, that as he says, you know, we would stand around the side and look mean, like Black Panthers. And he says, the stars just ate up that shit. <laughs> that's, <laughs> sorry, but that's how he's, that's what he says. <laughs> uh -huh. And the walk-ons in this documentary, I mean, Jane Fonda and William F. Buckley and all the people that um, connected in one way or another with this movement. Talk about, um, how did the Panthers think about Martin Luther King? And, and just how did they think about 
nonviolence as opposed to violence is the way to get progress in America? Um, you know, part of what the Panthers believed and, and how they started out was with the gun and, and believed that you, that you had a right, it was, it was, you know, part of the Constitution, the right to protect yourself. So they did believe that. I, one of the things that I found, though, in the film is, is probably one of the times that, that the interviewing former Panthers that they got most choked up about is when they talk about the death of Martin Luther King. You know, and so there was real respect for Martin Luther King. And I think that we forget sometimes that the Panthers were part of this whole civil rights movement at that time. You know, I mean, as somebody said, you know, the Panthers drove a lot of people to Martin Luther King. You know, it was like, oh, maybe he's not so bad. Uh, <laughs> but uh, how did they think about, it did start as, as, and was articulated as self-defense, but it was also about revolution, right? right. And which was understood in a lot of quarters to mean armed revolution. Um, and that's certainly where Eldridge Cleaver took the cause of the Panthers. How did they think about that? I mean, did they want armed revolution in the U.S. in the end? I think, I think they did. You know, yeah. I, I, think, I think a lot of them did. I think that you know, part of the way the Panthers split, as, as we talk about in the movie, part of what destroyed the Panthers was you know, uh, Huey Newton and a huge faction mm -hmm. of the party wanted to kind of move away from the gun, wanted to move away from the idea of, uh, of violent revolution at, at the time. It and emphasized breakfast for children right. and sickle cell anemia research and right. the other they, programs. They had all these programs. Yeah. Uh, fam one of the most famous was the Breakfast for Children program. But, you know, and, and Eldridge Cleaver, who was in Algeria, who, who had f uh, flown the country uh, to go to Algeria, still wanted to kind of, uh, you know, immediate armed revolution. And that was one of the things that tore the party apart. Well, the next clip shows an armed battle in the streets of Los Angeles. This is after Herbert Hoover, for some time, has been tr trying to crack down on the Panthers. Can you just set up this? Yeah, this last clip? yeah. W one one of the main uh, principles of the Panthers was that you don't let the police just come and break your door down. If you're a Panther, you have to defend yourself as a Panther. And uh, there's a fam very famous murder in Chicago of a Panther named Fred Hampton. And so four days later. Um, in, in uh, L.A., California, the Panthers are, are very, very nervous because they think something's going to happen. And so they, they build, uh, in the Panther headquarters, they, they put sandbags all around the walls and built this whole kind of fortress inside the, the, uh, the headquarters. And the significance of that is when the police do raid, they can't get in because there's this, it's a fortress. And it, it goes into this huge gun battle that lasts five hours, which allows, the, and which allows the news to get there. So now the news is there filming this whole gun battle. And, and we interviewed uh, cops who were outside shooting in and Panthers who were inside shooting out. Let's please see that clip. Five minutes after 10, about four and a half hours after the original raid this morning. Running down the street now, towards the building, to see what's going on. There are police officers, look like Vietnam combat, uniforms, automatic weapons, holding us back. Shotguns everywhere you can look. We're looking right at the Panther headquarters. The devastation is astounding. The whole front of the building has been shot up, bullet holes all over the place, front door smashed down, screens ripped out. I got shot here, got shot in the arm, missed, they missed my head here. I got bucks shot all in me. They, they shot that room up, you know, so this arm was dead. So now I'm up there with, with just one arm, bleeding all down the face and stuff. Uh, but I'm alive. I feel free. I feel absolutely free. I was a free Negro. You know, I was making my own rules. You couldn't get in, I couldn't get out. But in my space, I was the king. In that little space I had, I was the king. And that's what I felt. You understand? That's what I felt. Can you just talk a little bit about that last interview subject? And, and, and how, why would he feel a sense of freedom when he's in the middle of a gun battle with, with well, the police. I, I think that one of the things that, that we wanted to do in this film 
was, you know, once we got that clip and we're in the editing room, we knew that that was something special, you know, that it was really something special. And that w one thing we wanted to do with the audience was just kind of bring you so that you could understand what he means by he felt free. That, you know, he was, as he said, he was making his own rules for once. Um, and so it's just an amazing statement. I, you know, I wish I could say that I'm the greatest interviewer on earth, but I, my question was like something like, well, how'd you feel? <laughs> That's a good question. And that, and that, and that, that was the answer he, he gave me. And, and I should say that, that both of the two gentlemen that you saw, the Panthers in that clip, have both passed away since we did the, those interviews about a year and a half ago. All right, well, my last question for you is where can people actually see the documentary? Okay, well, um, good question. Thank you. Uh, so the Black Panthers Vanguard of the Revolution is actually playing uh, at East Street Cinema, which is right down the street. Um, East Street Cinema, and so we're there till October 8th, and we've just got extended for our third week there. And the other thing is, is um, we're, we're open all over the country, and if, uh, if you go to theblackpanthers.com, theblackpanthers.com, you can find out all over the country where we're opening. And actually, I'm flying out to the Bay, San Francisco, and, and Oakland tomorrow at 6 a.m., because we're opening there this weekend. That's great. Well, thank you, and congratulations. Thanks so much. Else.